<laughs> My gosh, that's very brief. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, this is mostly my lab, but I'm Michelle Arkin. <laughs> Anybody doesn't know me, your boss probably. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's really a pleasure today to introduce Christian Altman. Thanks so much for coming to this special seminar. Um, he's in town with the Ambagon company where he's now the chief technology officer and he still maintains a part-time appointment at the university, the Technical University of Eindhoven in the Netherlands. I have to keep, even though I've known him for 10 years, I have to get the name of, before he was at, um, in Eindhoven, uh, he was a group leader at the Chemical Genomic Center of the Max Planck Institute in Dortmund, Germany, uh, where he met Luke Brunsfeld, who's now a close collaborator of his in Eindhoven. And um, their lab is dedicated to all kinds of really fascinating chemical biology in uh, supramolecular chemistry and mostly around 1433 stabilization in many different ways of considering the chemical biology of this protein-protein interaction. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Christian and um, I will be able to answer questions afterwards with this microphone. So it's like, yeah, game show style. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for these warm words of introduction. And um, before I come to the, let's say these fascinating molecules that work as autosteric stabilizers by binding to the interface between these 1433 proteins here in green and the target proteins represented by this um, crystal, co-crystallized peptide in, in blue. I will just use a few seconds or may, now maybe up to a minute to um, explain why we as chemical biologists and um, people um, in, interested in drug discovery are so fond of protein-protein interactions. Certainly, the reason for this is that PPIs are involved in essentially every aspect of um, uh, uh, life. Um, the number of PPIs estimated to be in humans by far um, outweighs the number of the single proteins that could be targets, for example, for drug discovery. Also, a protein is during the lifetime uh, mostly organized in complexes and to understand really the biology of a protein, you have to understand their interactions with other proteins. Also very importantly, um, protein function of a, is, is very often controlled by nature by um, the PPIs and very important for us, we can use small molecules to modulate these PPIs. So and if you want to do a modulation of protein-protein interactions, in principle, you have two strategies at hand. First, um, you can come up with a molecule that binds to one of the two protein partners and inhibits the interactions. Um, this is something that has been followed um, in the last, I would say, 20 years quite extensively with, with a lot of success. But what you can also do is to come up with a molecule that binds to both protein partners simultaneously and stabilizes the interaction. And in this latter part of in this latter strategy that we are following um, in our lab here um, is uh, uh, a number of nature's examples that actually exactly work like this. And maybe the most famous ones are the immunosuppressants rapamycin and FK506 um, that um, actually pro convey their physiological activity by, by gluing together two proteins. Um, but what is also can be seen here on this slide is that that is not only this complex natural product chemistry that can convey the um, job of uh, PPI stabilization, but also very simple molecules. For example, in the entire field of plant hormone activity, these molecules are mainly based on stabilizing PPIs. And if you, if you are in, in the chemistry or drug discovery, ligand uh, 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 fragment-based drug discovery field, for example, you, would, you could appreciate that there's nothing that is um, really uh, less complex uh, like, like this oxygen molecule, for example. Now, um, these are very nice examples if you want to kind of um, explain why you would and should follow the idea of PPI stabilization. And um, some years ago, uh, we have done a, tried a comprehensive, let's say, review about molecules that also are of synthetic um, origin and that have been found in, in uh, drug discovery projects here. And um, we, we set this up with some colleagues from, from industry. And I just want to give you one example that most of you, I think, are aware in any case is um, uh, molecules like uh, this thalidomide derivative uh, linalidomide actually have been found uh, to work as a, a PPI stabilizer or an inducer of a protein-protein interactions by a target protein gluing it to an E3 ligase. And this mode of action has been just um, ret retrospectively elucidated um, after these 
molecules have been already uh, used for, for some time in the clinic. And this is actually the case for many of these natural products also. For example, FK506 uh, and rapamycin have also first been used as, as, as really very, very useful molecules, but only after that been really shown to work as PPI stabilizers. And this is also a very good example if you give, for example, a talk to, to industry or to investors, because then you can say that a PPI stabilizer can be also a very successful, economic, economically a very successful molecule with, with um, Revlimit. I think one of the highest uh, selling small molecule drugs ever only, for example, last year um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, out, outperformed by, on the one hand, some biologics and, and certainly of the, of the vaccines. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is really an example that um, these molecules can also be very successful both in the clinic and, and certainly in the market. Now we are working on the stabilization of uh, 14 v 3 protein protein interactions and I don't know if everybody is really aware of what 14 v 3 proteins are or where this strange name comes from. So it's always a good idea to introduce this in the beginning of such a talk. Um, the name can be explained quite easily by the fact that more than 50 years ago now, or 20, 55 years ago actually, um, uh, these uh, two uh, researchers, Moore and Paris, undertook a systematic catalogization of all mammalian brain proteins. So what they did they bought a, a cow brain, went to a slaughterhouse, bought a, bought a cow brain, mixed it up, and applied the soluble protein lysate first to an ion exchange chromatography, collected the different fractions, and applied these fractions to a two-dimensional gel electrophoresis. And as it happens, these proteins eluded that fracture 14 and migrated to the coordinates 3-3 and the two-dimensional gel, hence this name 14 v 3 in this study, also dozens of other proteins have been identified, and all these lucky proteins got real names after that, <laughs> because they were enzymes and transcription factors and, and whatever, but only the poor 14P3s really stuck with this kind of dial number name. But as we will see also a little bit later, it's, it's, it's not a bad idea to just name it by a number, because to find really a descriptive name that um, describes what they are really doing is very hard to do, because they are doing so many different things. Um, so we are in our, in our lab, um, we are to a, a substantial part crystal, crystallographers. So we like to do crystal structures of 14 v 3 And um, uh, what I find is, 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 is quite a unique, uh, I would say, uh, fold or structure of these 14 v 3 is this picture here of the 14 v 3 dimers. So physiologically, they always come in dimers. And they display this characteristic W-like shape where um, each of the, of the monomers here is, uh, are built up by nine antiparallel helices and the helices three, five, seven, and nine constitute the so-called amphipathic group. And this is the place where the um, partner proteins in a phosphorylation dependent manner via a short peptide stretch bind to 14 v 3 proteins. And because this is a, um, a dimeric protein, they have uh, two versions of this, of this uh, amphipathic group. So 14 v 3 proteins can be really found in every eukaryotic organism. Um, in humans, we have seven isoforms, and they are really highly conserved in their primary sequence. So over the entire phylogenetic tree, from dictyostelium up to humans, the sequence identity of these 14 v 3 proteins doesn't drop uh, below 53% identity. So they're really once uh, kind of uh, uh, introduced by eukaryotic organisms, they really have been kept very constant. Um, and their, their physiological activity is really purely mediated by protein-protein uh, interactions, and they, they actually con have their fingers everywhere. I mean, it's, they control a lot of physiological processes. And um, uh, when, when you give, for example, when I give this, this, this talk to a, in, a, in a context of a pharma company, I ask people from different indication fields, oncology, neurodegeneration, inflammation, metabolic disease, whatever, and I tell them, um, give me a physiological process or disease that you are interested in, and give me one minute time with a search engine like PubMed and Google, I will come up with at least five involvements of 14 v 3 in your area of interest. And most of the times it's rather 50 than five, to be honest. So, so they are really doing a lot of, of different things. And the reason why they do this or why they can do this is that there are more than 500 interaction partners described as 14 v 3 partner proteins. And these are the confirmed ones. There are studies based on proteomic studies and in silico approaches that rather say that the, and let's say the entire part of the protein that can interact with 14 v 3 are, are around 3000 proteins. So 15% of the entire proteome 
um, can and most probably does bind to 1450. And this is certainly also the explanation why you can find them everywhere. Um, 14PV proteins bind via short phosphorylated sequences to, um, uh, with a central serine or threonine um, uh, uh, residue to these amphipathic groups of the 14PV proteins. So this is, this is something that, um, for example, works very well in crystallography. So we, it's, it's very easy for us to crystallize these intrinsically disordered short sequences with 14PV3s and, and actually we have solved uh, hundreds of these, of these structures already. Um, okay, what, what happens actually when the 14 3 binds to their partner proteins? There are many examples where 14 3 binding leads to inhibition, um, very often combined with degradation with their partner's uh, proteins. Uh, one of the famous examples are BTK and Blink1, but, but also uh, transcription factors like, like the FOXOs or, or YAP and TAS are inhibited and degraded by this way. Now, very interesting also for drug discovery, very often 14 3 proteins stabilize and activate the target protein. And certainly if you have a means to further enhance this effect, you have something that is very useful in the context of, of drug discovery. For example, by enhancing the activity of mutated um, CFTR, this is the channel that is um, mutated in cystic fibrosis. And there are a lot of other proteins here, maybe P53 and TET2 as tumor suppressor proteins are uh, important to mention here. And then there is, um, a very um, important activity is the regulation of the subcellular localization of their of their target proteins. And here, especially transcription factors are very often inhibited by 14 3 binding in the cytoplasm, which inhibits nuclear import. And this certainly functionally inhibits a uh, transcription factor. Now, if you look into the or over the entire um, interactome of 14 3 proteins, and you do the exercise that I described, looking at um, partner proteins that are involved in disease, you can find a, a number of, I would say, very famous proteins that are regulated by 14 3 For example, in the field of cancer, we have here the, the, um, the RAF kinases, P53, um, uh, some, some, some other uh, transcription factors, but also uh, proteins like uh, CDC25. Um, in neurodegeneration, 14 3 proteins bind to alpha synuclein, LERC2, tau, and the intracellular fragment of the amyloid uh, protein. Um, and inflammation, a lot of uh, transcription factors uh, of, of um, scaffold proteins, but also enzymes and receptors are regulated and bound by 14 p 3 And you can do the same, for example, at diabetes or metabolic disease. Actually, you can do this exercise with every disease that you can think of, even um, COVID, for example. COVID uh, is, is also involved in there. So this means that, that certainly this is a great opportunity for us to for chemical biology and drug discovery, right? So, and this is also what, what, what we are following both in the, in the lab and also with uh, our company that uh, I will talk a little bit later about. But the question is, do we have the chemistry to do this? And some years ago, we, we did uh, again with um, some people also from, from pharma industry, from, from friends from pharma, to um, catalog the, um, let's say, available chemistry for 14 PPI modulation. And at that time, there were a, a number of um, molecules uh, known some of them were very um, exotic, like, for example, the supermolecular stabilizers, uh, these supermolecular ligands, um, or, and, and, and certainly these, these natural products. <clears throat> but this, let's say, chemistry that is available for 14 3 PPI stabilization has grown, I would not say exponentially, but very strongly in the last two or three years. And so this um, uh, kind of review really definitely needs a, a, a backup. So that means we have both the biological hypothesis that speaks in favor of stabilizing 14 3 PPIs, and we have the, let's say, chemical toolbox uh, to do this. And um, the second question certainly is then, how do we think about specificity of these interactions? Now, the fact is that um, the way these different partner proteins interact with 14 3 via these short phosphorylated, sometimes also unphosphorylated, intrinsically disordered um, uh, regions or motors of the target protein um, is, is very different in the different cases. And we have here just an example of, uh, of three partner proteins, ER alpha P53 and this carbohydrate response element binding protein that we have uh, solved in our lab, um, the, the atomic resolution structures of. And maybe you can already appreciate that the way how these motifs bind to 4353 is very different in these three cases. And these differences, so the diversity and in the interfaces between the partner protein and 4353 can be translated 
into the, um, let's say, availability or the um, identification of specific chemistry that binds to the interfaces and that is able to stabilize these interactions in a potent uh, but also selective uh, manner. And here are just a few examples. If you have, for example, with ear alpha an interface um, that is uh, more or less presenting the uh, about 40% of the entire channel, you can work with very big molecules like this natural product fusicoccans. If the space is a little bit more restricted, like with P53, what um, so far has worked quite nicely are uh, fragments that can be identified. And certainly with some other cases, uh, more, um, let's say, elaborate, but still synthetic molecules like this phosphonates here can, can stabilize the interaction. Now, what is also very important is that um, I mentioned before that the 14 3 proteins bind to the target proteins via this a short, a short phosphorylated and intrinsically disordered um, uh, protein regions. And uh, this might be a key to access um, protein disorder for drug discovery in a systematic manner. By taking advantage of the idea that certainly it is very difficult to find a molecule that binds with high affinity and high specificity to the disordered state of an intrinsically disordered protein or a protein region. Now what 14 3 proteins are doing when they bind to um, these, these uh, disordered proteins, they force the part that makes an intrinsic um, or in, 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 in contact with uh, the 14 3 proteins in a well-folded interface, like seen here. And this is actually a, a not a, I don't know, cartoon, but this is a real um, uh, crystal structure that we have solved, where uh, when we look at the interface here, so the red part that was, in, that was in initially um, intrinsically disordered is forced into a fold. And then we crystallize this in complex with a small molecule that stabilizes this interaction. And the interesting thing is that if you, if you look at the architecture of these interface pockets, they are more comparable rather with, let's say, active sites of enzymes than with a typical PPI interface, which very often is flat, featureless, and people say, well, to bring in a, a, a small molecule, binding with high affinity is very difficult. It is, it is more easy and more straightforward with these kind of, of interface pockets. So we have in this kind of disorder to order transition, really the creation of um, legendable uh, PPI interface pockets. Now we have worked on the stabilization of 14 um, uh, PPIs by small molecules with a number of different target proteins ranging from enzymes like CRAF over transcription factors like uh, CREP and ER-alpha, uh, um, and uh, up to um, um, uh, molecules uh, or to, to, to proteins like, for example, USP8 in a number of cases. And I would ju just wanted to highlight today um, two of these, uh, or three of these stories, uh, starting with, with ear alpha and um, just showing you how we are using the information about the binding mode of um, a natural product as a tool compound to come up with chemistry that is more, and, and that shows a biological activity to come up with chemistry that is more actionable. And this is a fragment-based drug discovery where our um, strategy is to find fragments that bind in the pocket of this um, natural product and then optimize them ultimately to something that also shows a biological activity. Now the story starts uh, uh, where, we, where we have kind of shown this uh, initially is the uh, example of the estrogen receptor and I don't, I think I have to explain to you that this is a very important target in, in um, uh, estrogen dependent uh, breast cancer, where the first line treatment is the use of an antagonist of, of ear alpha. But as we all know, that this brings a, a lot of, let's say, difficulties, in, especially in terms of a resi resistant development. So it would be a good, let's say, uh, um, um, alternative or additional approach to um, inhibit the activity of estrogen receptor alpha in a, in a um, uh, autosteric way. And um, <clears throat> we have started this project by uh, this publication where we have found in 2013 that 1453 actually binds to um, estrogen receptor in the so-called F domain, which is the extreme C-terminal part of the estrogen receptor. And we had here two key experiments showing that when you stabilize the interaction of 1453 to ear alpha with our two compound fusicoccan, the um, um, transcriptional activity of ER alpha is dramatically reduced. And the second important experiment, if you take away the physiological regulation 
of E alpha by 14 p3 by mutating the 14 p3 side, the basic day basal activity of this transcription factor is, is massively increased. So that means that 14 p3 really seems to be a very important um, physiological regulator of this nuclear receptor. And um, in this work, we have, for example, then also kind of put together um, from the experimental data, what is our working hypothesis, how 14 p3 influences um, E alpha. So, so the idea is that um, normally E alpha certainly dimerizes upon ligand binding, moves to the nucleus, and then starts a transcriptional program that when overactive can lead to breast cancer. 14 p3 proteins seem to bind 14, uh, E alpha um, 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 also partly in a liganded manner, but in, uh, prevents the nuclear import of E alpha. We also might have some, some indication, but this is, this is not, not proven yet, that then also ultimately this complex is um, facilitated towards degradation. And what we have also shown in this uh, um, study from 2013 is um, how this uh, fusicoccan molecule, this complex natural product, stabilizes the interaction by binding to the interface between the E alpha peptide and 14 p 3 now, when you show this molecule to a medicinal chemist, they say, well, it's very beautiful, but I don't necessarily have to work with that kind of chemistry. And I can understand this even as a biologist that <laughs> some people say, well, I could, could, could give some inspiration, but maybe, maybe not, I don't know, tinker around with that thing. But what we had in this, star, in this, in this um, uh, uh, initial um, story here in PNAS is, is the, the, the crystal structure and the detailed environment, how this molecule binds to um, the interface between E alpha and, 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 and 14 v 3 And um, it was now um, some 12 years ago where um, uh, I met uh, Michelle on a, um, in, a, in a conference and um, we were, I already knew her work in, let's say, uh, putting fragments in a directed manner somewhere in the interface or at any place um, in a protein where you want to develop a high uh, affinity binding ligand. And I was thinking it might be a good idea to, to use her approach to fill that pocket where the fusicoccan molecule is in. It took me a little bit of uh, convincing <laughs> before, before we really started this, but ultimately, um, <laughs> We, we, we uh, kind of put a plan in action where um, um, Luke and I, we sent um, one of our PhD students, uh, Eline Schribesma, and by that time she was uh, still a master's student, by the way, to um, Michelle's lab. And um, together with a PhD student of uh, Michelle, of uh, Ken, here they uh, work together in trying to find molecules that bind, or fragments that bind into this pocket. Now what helped a lot is that there is a native cysteine um, in the vicinity of this fusicoccan binding pocket, so that allowed the screening of a disulfide um, uh, thio uh, library here at, at uh, UCSF um, for molecules that could bind to this pocket. And I don't think that I have to uh, explain to this audience how, how all this fragment-based um, uh, drug discovery with this tethering works, but just the idea for everybody online here, for example, um, what you do is you have these kind of fragments and, and when they bind initially with, uh, let's say, low affinity to this, to this pocket here, they bring um, this, uh, this disulfide into the um, close vicinity of the sulfur dye group of cysteine, um, um, facilitating a, a disulfide bond. And uh, this can then be, or the covalent, covalent um, addition of this um, molecule can then be measured by MS. It's very useful to identify these weak affinity binders. Um, and because this is a very targeted um, approach, you can really uh, kind of uh, determine beforehand where you want to have this molecule bound. But, and, and also one of the examples also or advantages that is not a functional screen. You don't have to, for example, in this case, already um, prove stabilization, but you can just identify these molecules by physically uh, uh, binding to this, to this interface. Now, because we wanted to also find out what is the best place to put the, let's say, covalent anchor to, um, to, the, to the pocket, we introduced also to, to additional cysteine positions at, at uh, position 42 and 45 that are closer to the interface with a, with a peptide of, of E alpha. And what um, Ken and um, uh, Elina initially found is that if um, you move the anchoring point closer to the um, interface with, with, the, uh, with, the, with the peptide, 
the um, percent tethering as a, let's say, success rate for finding these molecules increased quite a lot. And um, this then uh, led to the identif identification of, of a number of, of, of very nice, um, let's say, starting points for, for further optimization that binds you into this, into this pocket. And I will just show um, a, the electron density of a, of a follow-up molecule from this, from this study. Where this here is the, the fragment um, covalently bound to the uh, cysteine position 42, so one of these introduced uh, cysteine positions, and in the in the vicinity of both 43 and the and the peptide. And if we do an overlay with um, where the fusicoccan molecule sits, we can see that that it really kind of um, uh, uh, binding or or or, or substituting some of the interactions that this natural product is engaging within the interface. So this is a really a very nice a starting point to, to um, um, uh, optimize this towards an autosteric PPI stabilizer. And in this initial story, we have already seen that um, uh, some of these, of these molecules show some uh, quite um, uh, nice activity towards stabilization of the complex between 14 and the labeled ER-alpha peptide. Um, they are in the in the uh, so-called EC50 uh, compound titration uh, already as um, almost as active as fusicoccan, and in the um, dependent um, let's say apparent KD titration where you measure the apparent KD of the peptide binding to 1453, um, they are almost as good as the uh, fusicoccan molecule. Now I said almost as good uh, uh, because in in the follow-up uh, in a, one of the follow-up stories. Um, where we kind of further optimize these compounds, we, we now have compounds or we, we, we could publish compounds that are really um, uh, better than FC. And, and we have also unpublished uh, material that uh, where we could uh, further increase uh, this, this potency. What we also did in a, in a follow-up story is answering the question, do we always need to have a, a cysteine that is present in the 14 3 well-folded um, adapter protein? Or can we also use a cysteine that is natively um, present in the, in the peptide of the target protein. And one of these examples where this is the case is um, the transcription factor or nuclear receptor ERA gamma. And what we did here is um, we use fluorescence polarization to identify fragments that um, actually bound to a cysteine in the peptide protein and in the peptide and stabilize the interaction with, uh, with the target protein. And as I said, we, we use this, this protein here, estrogen receptor, estrogen related receptor gamma, where we have in the DBD a 14 binding motif that, ex, that shows a cysteine at the plus one position. And um, this is again, very close to this, um, let's say we know and we name it the fusicoccan pocket, pocket either. Uh, also when in many cases, like for example, in this fusicoccan cannot really bind, but it's describing the the, um, the, the interface pocket quite well. And we found in a, in a screen um, uh, fragments that, that actually were able to stabilize the interaction. We, we crystallized this, these complexes and um, also shown that uh, stabilization takes place when you put this fragment to the peptide instead of the, of the 14 3 protein. Now this is, I think this was our first let's say success story that we can use these uh, tethering or, or fragment-based ap approaches for finding molecules that stabilize the interaction of 14 3 Just want to um, uh, uh, share a second um, success story where we are using the kind of same approach of covalently anchoring a fragment in the interface between the 14 3 protein and the, and the peptide protein. And this is um, an interaction that takes place between the P65 um, subunit of NF kappa B. So the theory here published by uh, in, in this uh, journal of cell uh, journal of cell science um, publication was that 143 um, proteins can bind to P65, and, and also um, simultaneously with, to I kappa B alpha, and this leads to nuclear import of this um, complex and therefore um, inactivation or attenuation of activity of NF kappa B, which certainly would be an interesting um, part also, also um, or an interesting strategy for, for a drug discovery project. So as a starting point, um, 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 my PhD student, uh, Madita and, and Pim solved the crystal structure of the binary complex of this P65 um, uh, uh, um, uh, fragment or 
peptide. And we saw here immediately, okay, this fusicoccan pocket is, is available still. So this prompted us to screen a library of some derivatives of this uh, natural uh, product. And um, especially compounds were quite active that lacked this um, C12 hydroxyl uh, that you can find in the, in the natural product. So these are semi-synthetic derivatives, uh, for example, DPO05, that don't have this um, uh, hydroxyl, and they were um, quite um, active in, in stabilizing the binding of the peptide to, to 14 v 3 with, with some reasonable um, um, activity. Now, when we saw the crystal structure of this, um, we, we uh, saw two things. First of all, there was a, a slight rearrangement of the peptide, kind of in, as an as an uh, induced fit uh, towards uh, the binding of the of this natural product, and we also could explain why um, the DPO5, this uh, fusicoccan derivative um, activity, is selective towards um, uh, what what happened what in, in stabilization with P65 and comparison with um, some other interactions. For example, with CFTR, we also know that this interaction can be stabilized by fusicoccans, but with a, with a much, um, let's say, lower um, cooperativity. And cooperativity is actually the parameter that uh, we should use in optimizing this chemistry. And this is a concept that, 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 that for many people in drug discovery and in, in pharma is, is, is a novel one because in pharma, you, you very often um, optimize, I mean, later also for physiological parameters, but, but initially for, for potency that is equivalent to, to binding affinity to your target protein. But with PPI stabilizers, that is not the case because you can have a high affinity binder that for example, takes most of its binding and, and energy by binding to 14v3, and only very few to binding to the peptide. And this is something that you definitely don't want to have because then you have a molecule that binds to, to every 14 v 3 protein and in, in, in the worst case also inhibits a lot of these interactions that would be a very nice uh, toxic compound, but definitely not, not a drug. So this is very important to, to um, have this as a, as a, as a concept um, um, evolved by, by, these, by these natural proteins. And I think we, this, this P65 is a quite, quite nice example how this, how this works and what principles are at play here. Now, but still the same argument about, okay, medicinal chemists and natural products um, led us to the um, idea now, if we look at the interface between um, the P65 uh, compound, uh, P P65 um, uh, peptide um, sequence and 14 v 3 we identified here a conserved lysine that uh, is, uh, contributed from uh, the, the, the 14 v 3 proteins we asked the question, is it possible to um, anchor something covalently here at this lysine 122? We did a lot of, uh, did a, a kind of limited screening of, of, um, of, of, of aldehyde chemistry to, uh, that, is, that is able to interact with this lysine here in a covalent manner and identified a, a, a few um, initial hits that we also elaborated a little bit more and tried to find out what what are the, let's say, driving principles to increase the potency of, of, these, of these compounds? Since 1453, crystallography luckily worked very nicely with this. Um, my PhD student, Madita, was, for example, in, in, in her PhD, um, able to solve some 85, 90 crystal structures of these compounds in complex with P65 and 1453. And what we kind of uh, found out is certainly is that our concept that for a good cooperativity, the binding energy or the context, the peptide, and the 14v3 should be in the ideal case, um, more or less 50-50, so the same, seems to be right. Because if we have fragments that, um, and, and in this case here, are um, interacting uh, more strongly with the 14v3 proteins than with the kind of movement toward the peptides, the stabilization factor is, is less than with fragments that really kind of move more to the to the peptide. So this seems to be a, a concept that that is intuitively, but um, but uh, that, that we have also uh, shown works works here. Now in the next story, we use this kind of chemistry to also answer the question: Can we can we make this uh, also selective? Because this lysine is conserved in in 14 v 3 and it, it could well be that you develop um, covalent chemistry that uh, stabilize every 14 v 3 PPI interaction. This is certainly something that is not uh, very useful. 
And so for this new project, we used another peptide that has shows a different environment of the lysine 122. So in the P65 um, uh, uh, case, it was the, the plus, uh, plus one amino acid that really is in the close vicinity of this lysine is an isoleucine. And we used um, the, the PIN1 phosphorylcine 72 complex because a tryptophan is here, the plus one amino acid. So what we, we started this project by taking uh, 42 of the, of the so-called silent binders, so that really physically bind to the interface of P65 and, and 14P3, and, and screened these for activity and stabilization with uh, PIN1. And <clears throat> of these 42, we really found 11 that uh, showed some initial stabilization of uh, the interaction with PIN1. We, we also crystallized some of, of, um, of, of those. And then we uh, try to optimize them towards uh, both um, potency and selectivity towards PIN1. And this is a concept that is, that is very nice in PPI stabilization because in, 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 in principle, when you make a molecule more specific towards the interface of a given peptide with 14P3, um, you also increase the, the potency and the other way around because you are trying to um, adapt to this very unique environment and make specific contacts that are, can only be found in this environment. And this is something that, that also seems to work. So, because when we have, for example, this, this fragment here um, that uh, is, is on the one hand making this, this uh, very nice interaction with um, the tryptophan plus one position, but what it's also doing is it's um, initiating additional contacts between um, the peptide and 14P3. So it's, it's not only the interaction of the, 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 the molecule or the, the molecular glue with the peptide, but also a kind of a, a secondary um, enhancement by, um, let's say, not, directed, not directly um, molecule um, uh, involved a binding between the peptide and uh, the 14P3. And this um, worked also very nicely in terms of selectivity. And this is here just an example of, of three of these uh, elaborate fragments um, compared also with the activity of uh, fusicoccin alpha with um, e, of, of fusicoccin A with E alpha that we have seen in the in the first example. And and what we could really see is that uh, among uh, across a, a a certain range of different plus one amino acid positions of these um, interacting motifs we could really find uh, molecules that are um, reasonably selective. And you can show this in, in a, a diagram like this. So this is a second example where I think um, a covalent anchoring of a fragment in the interface of 14 view with a partner protein could lead to a, a very useful um, starting point for, for a molecule and even drug discovery. Now, changing for the third and last example, a little bit uh, gears in terms of, let's say the chemistry that we are using here, um, I would like to come to the um, activation of um, the CFTR chloride channel um, by, by 14V3. And <clears throat> I mean, this chloride channel is the, the causing of mutations in this channel is, is uh, causing cystic fibrosis um, by mainly in the lung, um, um, kind of leading to a phenotype where um, uh, the, the mucus uh, that is, that is uh, on the top of the epithelia of, of lung cells is uh, thickened by an impaired um, uh, chloride export in the epithelial cells. And um, <clears throat> as I said, this, the, the cause for this has been found in, in, in a number of, um, well, actually in hundreds of, of different mutations in the CFTR um, chloride channel. And what has been found um, now also, yeah, almost uh, 10 years ago, is that 14 v 3 proteins bind and regulate the stability, activity, and biogenesis of uh, CFTR, and also help to bring CFTR to the plasma membrane. Now, this is a very um, complex interaction that takes place by the, in, in, uh, by the intrinsically disordered part of this uh, channel, which is the, called the regulatory domain. And in this um, uh, paper here, um, the authors have, for example, shown that there are nine phosphorylation sites in the R domain that can mediate the binding of 14P3 proteins. So this is something that is that is uh, quite a complex interaction. And luckily we don't want to inhibit this interaction because this would be, I think, quite a challenge. We want to stabilize this. And just if you think about the concept of multivalency, 
if you have a different contacts of two proteins with each other and you just want as a net effect increase the stability it is sufficient to stabilize one of these interactions and you have a, the right net effect with ppi stabilization this would be very difficult none although the certain the concept of, of the hotspots is is, is is important there but but i think it will be would be more challenging than than the um, ppi stabilization concept now, what we did in, in the first initial study is to, um, again, uh, look into all these interacting um, phosphorylation sites in a systematic manner by making monophosphorylated and, and, and dephosphorylated um, uh, peptides, uh, measuring their affinity and also solving uh, the crystal structure of, of these. And one of the peptides that bound with um, the best affinity and most probably are also the physiologically most relevant um, um, interaction or, or phosphorylation motors are uh, the phosphoserine 753 and 768 aside. And um, this molecule or this peptide we also used to screen for stabilizers of, um, of, these, of these interactions. So and what we have found is that, um, again, our tool compound Fusicoc and A is doing here a nicely job by uh, stabilizing this interaction by a factor of, of nine also shown here, not only by FP, also by ITC. And we also solved the crystal structure of this. And this was work that is, uh, was done by, by, by Lou Stevers, um, my former PhD student who also now works at, at Ambergon Therapeutics at our 1433 molecular glue company. And importantly, I mean, this is nice to have a crystal structure and a biochemical assay, but importantly here we could show that uh, we have a dose dependent increase of the main mutation of CFDR, this is the F508 deletion mutants, which is responsible for approximately 70% um, of the cases in, in cystic fibrosis. And this is a version of the, of the channel that normally doesn't make it to the plasma membrane because it is degraded um, be before this. But when you enhance the interaction with 14P3, a certain percentage of this channel can be identified at the plasma membrane and also is functionally active there. Now, again, for the, for the third time, I'm making a comment about um, uh, usefulness of fusicoccin as a tool compound versus a drug development candidate. So what we did in, in the kind of follow-up story is to um, ask a question, can we find additional and let's say more actionable chemistry for the job of stabilizing this interaction and bringing the um, uh, channel to the plasma membrane? So we did a screen with this synthetic peptide here, uh, encompassing both of these important phosphorylation sites, screened a library of 5,000 microcycles and found in an initial screening a number of, of um, hits that showed a little bit of activity, but they were not too convincing yet. But what we could identify is these four, let's say, general scaffolds of these, of these microcycles um, that we used or th th that we used in collaboration with Cyclenium this is a, um, a, a microcycle company in, in Canada um, to design a second library of around 500 partners uh, of, of 500 molecules. And uh, with these, we had a much higher hit rate and activity um, of the hits that also um, are more strongly stabilizing than, than fusicoccin. So it just gives one example of, um, let's say our, uh, from this, state and story the, the, the top compound with this with a cyclenium 007424 which shows here a very nice stabilization in the um, uh, initial in the in the primary FP assay and also is uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, inactive when just uh, titrated with the peptide which is important as a as a negative control as you can see with with these molecules which are false positive. Molecules. So we also crystallized um, the, um, this, this compound in complex with the CFTR peptide and 14P3 and found that it shows a uh, previously undetected uh, mode of action that is um, kind of, uh, we, we call it the kind of lit, lit activity because it binds in a, in a kind of covering, a covering a mode of action towards the, um, uh, the, the composite surface of the peptide and 14P3 when the peptide is present there. And it also, um, this is a different site than fusicoccin. So if you, because this is here the site where, this is, where the macrocycle binds, this is the site of, of fusicoccin. And um, this is also the reason why when you combine these two, so you, you, you have a much uh, stronger activity than with a, the with a single compound activity. Now, overall, the, transcription, uh, the, the, the stabilization factor is quite high with a factor of more than 300. 
And we thought um, this is a good um, point to test the, um, oh yeah, and this is also, we have um, certainly all the details. I mean, I will spare you a little bit, the, all the details of, of how this molecule is stabilizing this interaction, but it's, it's actually a combination of um, enthalpic and uh, entropic interactions with both the peptide and the 1453 protein as, it, as a PPI stabilizer, stabilizer should, should do. Now, this is the interesting part here because we were thinking about, is this a good compound to already look at some uh, cystic fibrosis specific cellular experiments? And what we have done here is uh, we have, we have uh, used in a, in a system where we have an uh, HA tagged version of this channel and um, measured of the 508 um, deletion uh, mutation. And uh, we measured the ability of a compound to stabilize the 1453 interaction to facilitate the transport and integration of this channel into the plasma membrane. And a number of these compounds um, um, uh, could, could do this and um, uh, so bring more of the channel to the, to the plasma membrane. But the important question is, is also chloride transport enhanced uh, in the, uh, with the activity of this compound. And again, here, our um, uh, compound, our top compound 7424 did quite a nice job. For example, um, compared with, with a uh, molecule from Vertex, which is, I think, the company that has uh, cystic fibrosis um, uh, treatment quite well under control at the moment. Um, and, and compared with, with some other, other compounds that didn't show this um, uh, very nice activity, um, we, we see a correlation between the, let's say, enhancement of, of chloride transport and the ability of stabilizing the interaction of the full length CFTR protein with 1453 in a pull down experiment. And this is also correlated with the, with the affinity um, or the stabilizing activity and not affinity, but, but rather a cooperativity of these compounds. Um, this also, what is also very promising is that um, we see an additive effect when we combine, um, for example, VX809 from Vertex with, with our compound and, and um, with this inhibitor, we can also show that this is really dependent on the activity of CFDR. And then lastly, in this um, more functional, more relevant functional assay, um, also our compound uh, uh, shows, uh, especially in combination with VX809, a very nice um, activity. Um, so this is, this is, I think, an example that shows also that you can activate very nicely uh, um, a, a 14 3 partner protein um, in, its, in, its, in its activity state. And as a summary, um, I think we have shown by now that we can use a number of drug or ligand discovery um, methodologies to find molecules that bind in a specific way to this interface of 14 3 with their target proteins and also um, uh, convey physiological, um, biological outcomes uh, of this stabilization. We think that this is a, a very nice systematic platform for the development of molecular glues for stabilized these interactions. And um, yeah, after I, I, I think all the people who are involved in the things that we have uh, shown before, both from industry and um, also of academia and, and certainly highlighting the um, let's say, contribution of, of the people in the lab, because, well, people like me, we are traveling around telling the story, but, but the actual work is not done by us, <laughs> by, but, but by the people who have their pipettes and <clears throat> whatever else they use in their hands. But what I wanted to just, um, in, the, in the end, um, um, I tell you is that since this development of molecular glues is, is a very nice uh, platform, we have uh, finally succeeded in, in, in getting a uh, setting up of this, of this, of this company, uh, Ambergon Therapeutics. And Ambergon is, is actually the name comes both from the um, Latin and the Greek um, root words amp and agon. That means uh, bringing together two components and stabilizes the interaction. And our molecules are these tiny little orange uh, things here. And, and this is actually here a real crystal structure between 14v3, one of our stabilizers and, and a partner protein. So we are the molecular glue company and um, <clears throat> we are um, actually three founders. Um, I guess everybody knows Michelle here. Um, and uh, from, from the, let's say, uh, Dutch uh, European side, um, uh, it's me and uh, Luc Brunsfeld, who is a professor of chemical biology in the TU of Eindhoven and the three of us are the founders who um, successfully um, uh, uh, were able to, to attract some, some investors. 
but not only investors, but also people that have um, experience in the drug development process, because, well, we are the scientists, we, we have some ideas and things, but it's certainly good to have um, the, the leadership uh, in the, let's say, um, real drug discovery um, activities that, that we are following up now with, um, with Ambergon. So with, with Scott and Nancy, I think we have uh, two very experienced uh, people there who can um, kind of uh, help us to steer the ship hopefully in the right direction. And maybe here for the people in the Bay Area, it might be interesting that we are also hiring uh, uh, a lot of, I mean, it's just that's the snapshot of one of the things, to be honest. Um, so so in, the, in, in Europe, we have the hiring process quite well under control. So there is, this, this, is really, this is really looking good, but, but it seems to be more challenging in, in the Bay Area, <laughs> as I heard remotely. <laughs> So I, I would invite everybody who would kind of um, recognize uh, themselves as, 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 as being able and maybe motivated to, to join us, to contact us and, um, uh, and, and think about a career and activity uh, in our startup Ambergon Therapeutics. And for you um, in the in online and uh, here in the, in the hall, I thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to some of your questions. Thank you. Do you want me to run around and look? Questions? So, so with with the CFTR, is it how much of it is preventing the degradation versus the actual functional effect of those mutations? So, to get it to the membrane, it's okay. I, I thought that it also affects uh, the transport. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's 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 very hard to say. I mean, there are there are. I mean, we have not really quantified this, but I think there is there's older vertex data who showed that um, if you have a molecule that brings more of the functional comp functional protein to the to the um, plasma membrane, it is sufficient to have 10, 15, maybe 20 percent of the total population that normally would sit there to achieve a, a clinical benefit. And I think that this is also something that our molecules can achieve. And this is, this is anyhow, uh, let's say a very good example of what you can do by, by, let's say, reactivating a loss of function of, of a protein. And I hope this also would translate to tumor suppressors that, that in contrast to, for example, kinase inhibition, you want to shut down 100%, that, that in an activa activating um, a strategy, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40% might be sufficient. And this looks like as a CFDR that this is the case. Uh, Christian, that was awesome. Really, really cool. Um, the CFTR example got me thinking about something I haven't really considered for these systems before. And, and maybe you could just inform me. Reversibility, right? So the 1433s bind um, to the phosphorylated peptides, usually phosphorylated peptides. Is their off rate simply driven by their dissociation constant for that complex? Or is there some regulatory element controlling that affinity? PTMs of the 1433 itself mm -hmm. or uh, competitive interactions with something? Yeah, because these, the CFTR example really made me think about this because the molecules are stabilizing the 1433 CFTR interaction, but that interaction is normally supposed to happen. Right? So something of either about the mutation about PTMs, something in the disease is clearly there's insufficient dwell time of the 1433 yeah. on the target to get the job done and your molecules push it the other way. But that got me thinking about the natural mm -hmm. regulatory mechanisms. If there's more opportunities there for chemical biology and drug discovery. Exactly. And I think the, the, the answer to this question might have two components. The first component is certainly what our molecules are doing exclusively is to, low, to, to influence the dissociation rate. So just the lifetime of the complex, the apparent KD is increased. But physiologically, what is the, let's say, on-off switch for the interaction is phosphorylation. And what we have seen with ER-alpha, for example, that if you, have, if you stabilize the complex you in, you, and, and you do, for example, an analysis of the phosphorylation site, you increase the, the ratio of the phosphorylated um, version of the target protein. That means you protect the off switch, the dephosphorylation by, and, and, I, and I think 
I, I can imagine that this physiologically is maybe even more relevant than the, uh, let's say, apparent KD influence of this interaction. And, and this is something that certainly also with CFER, but I would, I would say uniformly is, is, is of relevance for every uh, 1450 PPI. Of that in terms of the Chatley principle, too, that you're stabilizing, you're driving more towards the stabilizable yeah. state. Yes. Exactly. So the CFTR question. Brandon. Captured the mic. <laughs> Pardon me while I take over <laughs> um, So the CFTR question does it matter which um, vertex compounds you use? So to Adam's question, if you use other compounds that help trafficking versus, versus compounds that are activators, are they both cooperative with the 1433 stabilizers? I mean, uh, until now we have only a limited data set on this and, and, and this is something that we certainly plan to, to really uh, find out what, what, for example, is the best combination. Because if you look at cystic fibrosis as a disease in general, I think and I, I mentioned this before, what, what Vertex is doing is it's this fantastic job of, of, of really getting this disease under control. But, but that certainly, let's say, additional um, molecular um, strategies for increasing CFTR activities are needed because we don't know about what is the long-term effect and, and I don't know whatever can, can happen. So um, everything that we are doing has to be, I think, uh, be, be considered in the light of, of, of the correctors and potentiators of, of, of these kind of molecules. And, and the, the true um, clinical value can only be seen in, in, in these con combinations, I believe. So this is, this is really what, uh, something that, that we want to do in the, in the future to have a systematic analysis of the different outcomes of different combinations with, um, I mean, there are no, uh, a lot of molecules available to do that. Are any of the disease mutations? Are any of the disease mutations um, 1433 binding site mutations? No. no. Uh, that's, that is, that is, that's an interesting thing because, and then we have some, I mean, I, I, I have not this in, in this slide deck. We have some um, preliminary studies looking at different mutations where the 1433 approach uniquely works in contexts where the vertex compounds are weaker. It makes sense actually that they wouldn't cause disease because they're non-binding sites. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank him again. Thank you very much. I think you can see why uh, I was very inspired when I first saw him speak in Germany. <laughs> thank you, everybody. So you are meeting with him.